Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today, I'm speaking with an economics professor who literally wrote the book on economics, or more specifically, the new textbook on economics. But amazingly, he's not boring to talk to. Maybe it's because he's an Australian, makes everything sound down to earth and accessible, and he wants us all to understand how an understanding of economics can help us with the decision making in our everyday lives. He walks the talk. Let's learn from Justin Walters. Where to start? What would you What would you like? I always ask my guests because I'm writing a I write a song about every guest. Yes. So, and so, you know, what would you like to be? What would you like a song about? <laughs> Mate, I'm an economist. <laughs> please, please, don't say principles of economics the whole textbook because. Well, I'm not going to you know, advertise my words. That would but, be... <laughs> uh, I'm an economist. <laughs> I believe that economics helps us better understand everything about the world. I believe it's a powerful set of tools, and I believe that if we can empower people with that set of tools. They'll make better choices in everything from, you know, who to marry to what job to search for. Yeah, I've really, I, I really, how you use economics in every aspect yes. of your life. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, one of the things we often say every decision is an economic decision. Um, and mm. economics is not the only lens for looking at the world, but, um, it's one that's really powerful and I think can really help people. Um, and so, you know, we do try and get the gospel of economics out there. Um, and, you know, gospel makes it, it's not ideological. I mean, there are parts of economics that are ideological, but, um, you know, the more people know, the better they can make choices in their own lives, whether they're, you know, managers or, um, you know, every day on the playground with my kids or, um, mm. you know, and it, you know, it, so they're not they're not decisions just to relate to money. Then they're, definitely it's the, not. It's the framework. First day of the first class of my first sentence on the first day of my class begins. Economics is not about money. Um, you know, it's a way of looking at the world. Um, the way I describe it to my students: economists are no more obsessed by money than architects are by inches. Um, we uh, both use this a as a one. way of measuring things, but we're using them, um, you know, trying to construct something a little more elegant, useful, beautiful, fulfilling. Um, so, you know, m money is in economic models, but um, economics is about the full human condition. So, give so because your 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 partner is an economist as well. So, yes. how do you use these? How does it work in the in a day day to day life? Um, you know, you can think about any decision that you make. Um, so, uh, you know, during the time of COVID has been absolutely a stunning time to be an economist. Um, my students want to make sense of the world around them and economics really helps. So, you know, should I go to a restaurant tonight? Well, that's a cost benefit decision. Costs and benefits are an important part of economics. Um, it also involves risk. How do I think about risks? Um, it involves your actions affect other people. So I could go to the restaurant and maybe I'm young. And so even if I got COVID, I would be okay. But if I then go home and infect my parents, they're older and that would not be okay. When our actions affect others, that's something that economists study. Um, the technical word we use there is an externality. Um, if you are um, dating during the pandemic, there are all these questions like the person you're texting with right now might say, um, I've already had COVID, you don't need to worry. I, I couldn't possibly still have it. <laughs> now, that's what we economists call asymmetric information, which is they know whether they're telling the truth or not. Um, and, it, you know, it's not just dating, by the way. Employers need to know things like this as well. You know, who are you going to put behind the cash register at the shop? Hopefully it would be someone who's not going to infect all your customers. And so this is where all this conversation about COVID passports um, comes, on, comes in, where... We're trying to solve those problems. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, look, the, the the simplest example was when Betsy and I were trying to decide whether to have kids, um, which you might think is not an economic decision, but of course it is. Um, there's costs and benefits. Um, some of the costs are financial, but not all of them are. Um, so, you know, you know what the financial ones are. You have to buy diapers and food and all that. But no parent would say that was the important stuff. The important stuff is you're waking up at 3 a.m., 
you give up much of your social life. Um, you lack <laughs> flexibility. You have to pay for childcare. That's that's you know if you work. Um, and what are the benefits? Well, none of the benefits are financial, um, but they're real. If you have mm. a kid and they look up and they smile at you, your heart skips a beat. Your heart's a little fuller. Um, we economists would turn that into drier language and say there was a benefit. And we would ask whether mm. the benefit exceeded the cost. Um, and then there's the question, how many kids should you have? Um, well, the way an economist would approach that problem is to say we use what we call the marginal principle. Think one at a time. So should I have a first kid? All right, that was good. Should I have a second one? What's the mm. extra benefit from one more kid? What's the extra cost? Um, so the marginal benefit might be lower. The marginal cost is probably lower because you already have a bunch of toys around the house. Um, so that's an intensely economic decision. Um, economists have used have have used our tools to try and understand crime. You might think, well, crime is all about passion, or it's all about you know stealing and morality. But another way of thinking about it is that uh, becoming a criminal is an occupational choice. There are many occupations. You could choose to be a janitor and you could choose to be a criminal and the higher the pay of janitors the less attractive it is to be a criminal and yeah. there i'm thinking at the blue collar end at the white collar end right um uh we probably expect more securities fraud um when getting caught isn't gonna keep you out of the industry in the future um mm -hmm. so you know costs and benefits are always in the so people don't necessarily see themselves as thinking about the world through the lens of costs and benefits but if you say why did you make this decision if you listen mm. closely you'll hear them say things that ultimately we economists understand as costs and benefits i can understand with big decisions like having a kid or having a job but it would be paralyzing to me with the decide to go out to dinner or not and have to yeah. do all these calculations and absolutely so the caricature of economists is that we pretend that we that is that we think that people do that and they make a complicated spreadsheet before going for coffee. That's probably not right, but um, I like to have a coffee every morning. That's a habit that I've formed. Um, maybe you like to go to Starbucks every morning. Well, that's a habit that will cost you five bucks per morning, 25 bucks per week, uh, mm -hmm. over the course of a year, over a thousand dollars. So you probably at some point thought, is this a good habit or not? Do I really enjoy starting my day that way? Is it worth the years, the, the thousand dollars over the year. So sometimes we can make decisions in these bigger bunches um, than literally mm. trying to do these calculations one by one. I think where people find so it para it? I think where people find it paralyzing is um, when we're talking about things like friendship. Um, mm. Doesn't that sound awful? Should I hang out with this guy? Well, what are the costs? What are the benefits? It does sound awful. It sounds totally inhumane now on the flip side who do you like to, who do you hang out with most i hang out with people i really like mm. in economics we'd say i hang out with people where the benefits are large who do i avoid the most you know those whiny folks who are always asking you for a favor that is those who have the largest costs um mm. so I, I don't want you to rewrite the script of your life using a sterile language of economics but if you want to understand people's decisions that language can be powerful we have this terrible inflexibility, though. For example, when, I, when I've when i moved to a city for the first time, the friends that I've had after two years are the friends I had after two weeks. I kind of get full mm -hmm. of my calendars full, and I, I don't have... You make appointments for next week every time. Yep. So it's hard to... And the same with relationships, no? Yes. Um, so economists would think of that as a search problem. Uh, there are many people out there, just like, you know, um, there are many brands of breakfast cereal. Uh, how how many brands of breakfast cereal should you try before you move on? Um, mm -hmm. If you've tried a few and this most recent one seems really good and most of the others aren't that much better, stop searching, right? Well, you can think about looking for a job in very similar terms. We think about workers looking for jobs and you look mm -hmm. through, it used to be the newspaper and now it's the web, looking at a whole lot of job ads and you apply to a whole lot, and then you sometimes you get the job, but you don't always accept it. Uh, and so at what point is the job good enough that you want to accept it? Keep thinking this way, and you'll realize that if workers are searching for jobs, jobs are also searching for workers. An employer puts out the ad, they have to decide how many people to interview. 
when do I stop interviewing? Mm. Keep thinking this way and then you'll realize that just as workers look for jobs and jobs look for workers, potential husbands look for potential wives and potential wives look for potential husbands. Mm. It's the exact same set of decisions. And then we've now gotten all the way from the labor market and also the market for cereal to what you started with, which is searching for friends. Uh, and may be that you're very good at, in a new city at discovering pretty interesting people within the first two weeks, in which case two weeks of search is enough. If you were really shy and you didn't meet many people in the first two weeks, I'd say keep searching. Um, mm -hmm. And in some sense, the question is how long should you search? And that, again, depends on the benefits and the costs. Do you think you have these different needs? Like I have the need for Friday night company and I have the need, you know, I have the need for Sunday. I have Sunday available for socializing. So once those needs get met, Maybe I could have a better conversation or I could have a better physical relationship or something like that. But we kind of just, the box is ticked. So, Right, so you're making it sound like uh, people are just like lazy. But maybe it's not laziness. You're right. Like, look, here's the least romantic thing you'll ever hear. Um, people in relationships often say, I found the one. What mm. is the chance? If there is one and there's 8 billion people on earth and let's say you're only interested in one gender. So there's 4 billion people who might be of interest to you. Let's say you're only interested in a particular age group, so 2 billion. Still, what is the chance that you're going to find the one in 2 billion who's the one for you? <laughs> no, it's just like breakfast cereal. You'll keep searching till you'll find one where the benefits of continuing to search no longer exceed the costs. So look, mm. there is no Mr. or Mrs. Right. Um, there's Mr. or Mrs. Right enough that it's not worth searching anymore. And so once you've met someone who's pretty good, you could stay single for another five years hoping to find someone better. Um, mm. But that could be painful if that's not the life you want to be living. I was reading your, about your book and the four principles in it, and I've actually written songs about two of them related to relationships. Wow. Well, yeah. So you really have <laughs> learned to think like an economist. Well, I, I, I did study economics A-level back in England. Uh. and. I didn't have a textbook as not as well written as yours, and it was, it was just Keynesianism and um, monetarism, and it was very dry. And I, 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 I'm not so I didn't fail. I just scraped through, but I did remember the definitions of opportunity cost and the law of diminishing marginal returns, mm -hmm. and I applied both of those to relationships. That's exactly right, right. And you know, so you could be searching and searching for another partner or searching for a better partner has no financial cost, but it has an opportunity cost. Another year being single is another year not settling down. If you're at the point in your life where that's what you want to do, that's very high cost. If you're mm -hmm. 18 and just, you know, starting uni, um, maybe that's a much lower cost. Um, and so that opportunity cost is absolutely critical. And as you say, the more that you've searched, the more, the less likely it is that you're going to find anyone better than any of the potential matches you've made in the past. And that's how mm -hmm. diminishing returns would, would fit in there. Um, look, economics is not these boring definitions. It's people and their lives. And uh, I love the fact that you're able to take these principles that bored you the first time and animate them and make them interesting for you the second time. Yeah, because the opportunity cost of this, this is 20 years ago. So the girl staying with her ex-boyfriend was me. I was the best thing mm -hmm. she had, alternative she had to sacrifice. Yes. And um, But um, I was reading about another one because I was thinking of what song I can write and I was hearing you talk on another podcast about sunk cost fallacy. Yes. Um, so the sunk cost fallacy actually follows from the opportunity cost principle. A sunk cost is any cost that you've already incurred and you can't get back. And because you can't get it back, whatever decision you make in the future, that money's irrelevant because you could take one path or the other path and you've already sunk that cost. And so therefore you should ignore sunk costs. And it turns out that's something that's incredibly hard to do. Here's the simple question, Jack. How many times have you paid, say, 10 bucks for a movie and then walked out halfway? Not very often. For me, it's zero when I'm an economist. But <laughs> the fact that I paid 10 bucks for the movie, once I'm sitting in the movie, is irrelevant. That 10 bucks mm -hmm. is lost. I can never get it yeah. back. And so if I'm halfway through the movie and I realize I'm not going to enjoy the second half, Sometimes oh, I should stay to get my money's worth, but that's a mistake. I should just get the mm. hell out, right? And you've never done it. <laughs> I've never done it, even though I tell my students to do it. <laughs> the one that many of us know is you're 300 pages into a 400 page book. 
Mm. And you know it's going to be a grind to get through those last 100 pages and you're not going to enjoy it. Mm. And you say, but I've put so much in. I've got to keep going. Um, and so we end up reading books we don't like. So what you should do is, and to your listeners, leave bad movies, get rid of bad books, and then to give you, to come full circle, um, how many times have you heard a friend say, well, I'm with this person. We've been together three or four years. It's not working out, but I just can't leave them given how much I've put in. Mm. There's a movie that's their <laughs> relationship, and they just said the first half of the movie, you know, I, I had to pay 10 bucks to get into this movie. I was with them for a long time. Um, but I know the second half of this movie is going to be dreadful. Um, and so that's where they're thinking about sunk costs. And by the way, it's not just relationships. Um, it's not unusual to hear, um, we saw George W. Bush when we went to war in Iraq say, so many young men and women have lost their lives over there that we have to keep fighting. Now, the thing is, continuing to fight in Iraq wasn't bringing those young men and women back. It was a sunk mm. cost. He was literally making a mistake in the way that he thought about it. I interviewed Liv, Liv Bory, and she had a lot of parallels to you because she, her partner is also a poker player, so they talk about the same thing. But instead of economics, they talk about the odds. Yes. You know, like, what are the, what are the odds of us being together in, in five years, you know? And they both came out about 92%, 93 so they decided to go stay together. Wow. And so they, and, you know, they must also talk about the pot, you know, what the money's in the pot, yeah. Do you yes. forget about that, you know? Right, right. right. I mean, it's That's a little so bit hard. different in poker because when the money's in the pot, there's more there for you to win as well. So a pure mm. sunk cost is I've gotten rid of the money. So how much money mm. do I lose in the first half of the night? That's irrelevant to what the optimal strategy is for the second half of the night. I heard your partner on NPR, you were chatting together, and she said that one of the reasons she wouldn't leave, well, obviously, let me phrase this right, <laughs> <laughs> is that one of the benefits of you staying together is that, you know, in 15, when you're older, you can discuss memories yes. of, you know, we did time, we did this and that. So that's all, that's a sunk cost, but it has a payback. Right. So the sunk cost is how much money we paid for the holiday that we took together 10 years ago. That money's gone. Mm. It's irrelevant. Oh, so it's purely financial. Right. Well, it, and yes. And also the fact that I gave up a lot of time at work, even the non-financial part is. But that's what Betsy's getting at there is there's this other thing, which is memories, shared memories, valuable memories, mm. um, which are. And the important thing is those memories, her, she's arguing, are best enjoyed together. So mm. talking about that wonderful vacation when we're together and enjoying a glass of wine is incredibly valuable. If we were apart, she would be with her best friend saying, remember that vacation I took with Justin? And her best friend would say, he's a jerk. Um, and those mm, memories... Every memory's tainted, yeah. Right, so those memories are not a sunk cost because they have more value one way than another way. The whole thing about a sunk cost is no matter what choice you make, it's sunk. Okay. So, like, do they always talk in... I was, they call it the Concord... Uh... Fallacy yes, the Concord well, fallacy. It? That's right. Where the British government said, we've put so much money into making a Concord, we have to keep going. Mm. No, it was a bad project. It was like a bad boyfriend or a bad girlfriend or a bad movie. <laughs> but if I do write a song about it, can it be not just monetary? Is there also, you know, we've been together seven years and they get that itch and then... Exactly. No, I. anytime yeah. I use the word cost or benefit, I rarely mean money. Um, uh, it can okay. be... Um, it, you know, the the time you put in with someone is not just, you know, the money you put into buying furniture together. It's the relationships you didn't have. That's a huge cost of relationship, but that's sunk, right? You can't go back and have those relationships at age 19 anymore. Um, mm. You could have a different one in the future. That's a real cost. Take that into account. But the time you spent together is sunk. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking. I'm not, I don't want people to get the wrong idea that I'm unhappy in my relationship. I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm just that. You <laughs> just when I was thinking about it all. That's the point. No, no. <laughs> I use um, I use try and use karma because I'm um, as the as the as the to base the full decisions because I'm a vegetarian now karmically because I do like meat. I would eat it, but karmically, it's very negative for me. I am a vegetarian too. Um, yeah. But karmically, I'm, I don't know what to make of that. Um, I use the term ethically. Mm. Um, but it genuinely has like points on your on your karmic balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about the same thing. Um, mm. 
I find it unethical. I think inflicting that much pain on others, and they appear mm. to be sentient beings, um, mm. is something I'm not prepared to do. I it's a cost I won't impose on others. Um, That's quite an easy decision, though, because you can live perfectly healthy without meat, isn't it? I mean, you you look exactly the same, you feel exactly the same. I think you feel a little healthier, but I'm not here to preach vegetarianism well, to anyone. <laughs> No, but it's, 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 that's a very clear example. But what's also true about it is the cost of becoming a vegetarian has changed enormously over time. Um, as more people have become vegetarians, every restaurant now has to include vegetarian options. And so I became a vegetarian at a time when it was very cheap. And the harder question for you and I, Jack, is would you have been a vegetarian if you'd lived the same life 30 years earlier and most restaurants were not serving any vegetarian food? That's when you'd have to be committed. That you'd have to really mm. believe in what you were doing. Well, I live in the south of Italy, and if you know, I have to eat, I have to eat fish as well and cheese because they're delicious. Sometimes you go to restaurants. Yeah, yes, <laughs> there's no other alternatives. I do remember being in France and Betsy explaining to the waiter she was a vegetarian, and he simply looked at her and said, "I'm sorry." <laughs> <laughs> I um. You also discussed on your first date the economics of marriage. Is that true? Um, very complicated. So um, our... <laughs> and did a research paper on it. Yes. Um, so we got into an argument about um, what the effects of changing divorce laws would be. Um, so at the time, you know, the US had at the time quite recently, well, actually through the 70s and 80s, moved to deregulate divorce. And so it used to be that in order to get out of your marriage, both partners had to agree. And it moved to being what is often colloquially called no-fault divorce, um, but it's unilateral divorce, um, where if I want to leave, I just leave. And the question was, mm. what do you think that did? And I made the conjecture, which turned out to be wrong, that um, if uh, men couldn't for could no longer had the law forcing their wives to stay with them, that they would use the threat of violence to do that. And so I conjectured that that would cause a rise in domestic violence and a rise in spousal homicide. And so we argued about this and Betsy said I was certainly wrong. Um, and so we did what any... On your first date. I, we did what any couple would do, um, which is we uh, decided to gather the data and crunch the numbers. Um, and it turned out Betsy was right and I was wrong. And uh, that turned out to be one of our first publications together as well. And you've never got married. We have never gotten married. That's true. In fact, we used to teach a class at Harvard when we were graduate students there called The Economics of Marriage and Divorce. And I would begin by saying I've never been married nor divorced, but even so, I'm going to try and teach this class. Um, no, we have not. <laughs> but you do have two kids together, and it's... We do. It's, it's these days, yeah. And our kids are honestly quite confused by it all. Um, mm. They quite often say, mum and dad are married, and then one will remind the other, well, not married. Um, mm. you know, look, here's an interesting thing. Next time you go to a wedding, it's kind of mean to do this, but interesting. Um, if you're feeling really mean, <laughs> ask the bride. I want to sit, I want to sit at the table with the economist at the next wedding. I go to. Almost no one because says this that. sounds, um, no, but maybe it's, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's very, very interesting. The economics involved are, you know, uh, a father walks his daughter down the aisle and gives her away, um, if you don't see economics there, um, you know, there is, it was explicitly once upon a time, the transfer of property. Um, but um, ask the, the groom or the bride what marriage is. It's kind of mm. a deep question. So, you know, one thing they could say is it's a contract um, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, till death do us part. But it's not a contract because you can get out of it mm. without any damages. Um Another answer is that is insurance. If you think about it, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, um, that literally sounds like an insurance contract, doesn't it? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, until death do us part. There's even life insurance in there. Um, <laughs> another answer is that because it's not a contract, a wedding is a party. And mm. it's by this view, what's really important is most weddings invite a lot of your local friends and family. So you say yeah. these words out loud, 
the law won't enforce the marriage contract, but the whole idea of bringing everyone together is so that your community will enforce it even when the law won't. Um, and then, you know, the really hard, the real, if you want to be really mean, um, depending on what country you're in, you say to the bride or groom, and how will tomorrow's celebration change your taxable income? And for many of my friends, they say, I have no idea. And Betsy, who loves tax, will say, well, given your incomes, I think it'll raise your combined tax bill by $15,000 a year. You're making a big choice tomorrow. Yeah. It's going to cost you $150,000 over the next decade. If your wedding lasts uh, more than a decade, say 40 years, it's going to cost you $600,000. What is it you're buying for the $600,000 you're about to spend? Um, Do you get invited to many weddings? No, not anymore. No, used to. Uh, I think word got out. Um, so I'm we, getting married this year. We we try not to say this to the bride and the groom, but of course, uh, if we're uh, if if people are interested in economics, in fact, Betsy was asked to be the cele one of her students asked her to be the celebrant uh, at their wedding, um, where she was asked to give. I think she married them. She actually married them. She had you know you get one of these online certification so you can do that and she was asked to give a short reading um on the economics of marriage um so she described some of our work <laughs> now these were public policy students f from the university of michigan so we breed them a little nerdier than others um but you know different people have different ways Good of tell. approaching their wedding days <laughs> I, I told you i'm getting married this year this year so that's yes yeah Hopefully, well all things being so jack what is marriage um well we've been together 10 years now and um uh yeah it seems like a nice thing to do have a big party get everyone together get my my parents to come over my family to come over all my friends from all over the world they never come and visit me you know i live in the south of italy you think i'd be inundated with requests yeah. but no uh so, so it's just an excuse for a party so it's a party have you told yep. your fiance that you think that this enormous undertaking is a party? Is this um, her view too? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Very sure, modern yeah. of you. And have you guys calculated what your taxes will look like next year? Um, no. Hmm. Well, we pay taxes in different countries, so it yeah. still might affect it. Okay. And it, for some people, it actually leads to lower taxes. So maybe you're about to learn that you're going to save a bunch of money. Um, <laughs> anyway, who said this? I'm more, worried, more worried about the wedding bill. <laughs> yeah. Oh, crikey. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Very much. But maybe we should change speeds here because it's been a date. It's been more of an, uh, a relationship show than uh, than um, an economist podcast. So, so let's so talk. Maybe we economics. could talk. Yeah. Let's. What What I think everyone interested in now is obviously COVID and yes. the last year. And so we've gone for the micro. Let's go to the macro. So yes. They're, they're print, printing money. They don't even do that anymore, do they? But they're pumping money into the system. Yes. How is this going to affect? Are we all going to be paying so higher taxes soon? Or will there be inflation? What What are we in for? Right. So it, there's two things you're describing when you say we're pumping money into the system. The first is um, what we call monetary policy, um, which is that the Federal Reserve in the United States or the European Central Bank in Europe reduces interest rates. And the way it does that is by um, changing a bunch of zeros on a bunch of computers' bank accounts, basically. It's, it's, it's complicated, but it, it mm. involves print, effectively printing money. Um, and so they have reduced interest rates. And then the other thing, realize they're not giving money away. The other thing, they do, what they're doing is they're lending money. And so what you want to do is you want to make it easy for people to borrow, which means you need more lenders. And so that's what the central bank is doing. It's trying to keep interest rates low. So that businesses that need to borrow in order to get to the other side of COVID um, can borrow. Then the other side is what we call fiscal policy, which is the government spending money. When the government's spending money, um, it's usually borrowing. And by most measures, you have to pay it back sometime. Now, there's sort of a bit of an asterisk on that, which is the economy is always growing. So sometimes people say, well, we can't just borrow money. You know, Imagine if a household did that. And there's this deep question. No, a household's not like a country. And so one thing that's different is the income of a country, its gross domestic product, grows every year by about 2%. Yeah. And so our ability to repay our loans is always growing. So even if we don't repay our loans, the size of those loans relative to our income can be getting smaller. 
And so and they, inflation eroding them a bit. It's not even inflation. It's just like if your debt, if you owe a thousand dollars and your income is ten thousand, that sounds pretty bad. Hmm. But if you owe a thousand dollars and your income is a hundred thousand, who cares? Hmm. Now, if your income is going to grow from ten thousand to a hundred thousand, then how much should you worry about owing a thousand dollars right now? And sort of somewhere in between. Um, one way of thinking about the present moment is, is one reason people worry about debt is that future generations might have to repay it. But one way of thinking about the present moment is the way we think about a war, which is we borrowed a lot of money in World War One and then World War Two, because we thought we were buying something intensely valuable, freedom, and mm. future generations would get to share in that. So in some mm. sense, we're, by borrowing money, we're just asking future generations to pay their share. You could say that we're at war against the virus right now in the same way that we were once at war against the Germans. And if we succeed in this war, then we will bequest to future generations a healthy economy and a healthy virus-free country. And that's really valuable for them as well. Um, now, I should say there's one other way of thinking about this, which is, look, if people are down on their luck in 2020, but we expect them to be doing okay in 2022, 23, 24, 25, 26, mm. then what we want to do is take some money from their future selves to help them out today. And the way mm. you do that is by the government borrowing money and giving it to them today. So your parents can't conceive you if they die, for example. So you have to pay in the future. That would be one way of thinking about it. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. But it's also, even if it's the same person, if what the government's doing is charging future Justin, who's going to live in a good post-COVID economy, if they're going to charge him higher taxes and help mm. 2020 Justin, who was down on his luck, that mm. seems like a pretty good deal. We're effectively mm. taking from rich Justin and giving to poor Justin. So that's not. So even... you're in favour of this economic strategy? In the... I think that the present moment um, is really rough for a lot of people. And mm. so if we can find ways to make it a little work a little better for them, um, that'd be great. Okay. That's a real positive way to look at it because I was getting a bit worried about, uh, you know, because it's, it's it's a big, this big way they're doing it. In England, the, the government's paying everyone's salaries. Yeah, no, these are really very, very large fiscal transfers. It's unprecedented, no? It's bigger than a war, isn't it? No, nah, it's about a war. It's about one about war. A war. Um, you know, about war size. About one war. <laughs> a middle-sized <laughs> war. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are bigger wars and there are smaller wars. Um, mm. uh, but, yeah, and but you know, the thing is, war is not exactly something you want to do every day. Um, and you don't want to... But, is it, but isn't a war like everyone... You know, everyone's involved. Everyone's everyone's working. Everyone's put. But here, you know, you, you're, the way you can help is sit on the couch. So right. It's kind of. But that is valuable. I'm totally mm. serious. If you could go to work and infect a bunch of other people, or mm -hmm. you could sit on the couch, then sitting on the couch is intensely valuable. So mm. literally, what we need is more people sitting on the couch. <laughs> How do we do that? We pay people to sit on the couch. So, like, literally the dumbest policy I ever heard, and it was pursued in England, as I understand it, was they paid people to go to restaurants because they wanted the restaurants to get back on their feet. Now, paying people to go That's to restaurants dumb, yeah. to help the restaurant industry would be a great idea in 2018 or 2019, but in the middle mm. of a global pandemic where restaurants are vectors for infection, it was insane, and it actually led to a rise in COVID. So if that's dumb, what we want to do is the opposite of dumb. The opposite of dumb isn't paying people to go to restaurants. It's paying people to stay home uh, and not infect others. Realize that, you know, if you infect someone else, hmm. the cost of that is just enormous, right? Hmm. There's, as we know, about a one in a hundred chance that you'll kill them. And we think hmm. human life is intensely valuable. But also think about how often we're hearing about cases of long COVID, people with real ongoing health afflictions that are expected to last the rest of their hmm. lives. People really value their health and they would be willing to pay you a lot to not infect them. Now, it's very hard to walk around the street giving people money not to give you COVID. So we ask the government to do it for us. And the government says, mm. do these behaviors, stay home, for instance, that mm. will help other people out so much. And how is how reliant is our current economic system on this this GDP growth that you mentioned? Um. It's such a deep question. Um, mm. Look, if GDP growth stopped tomorrow, then all our incomes would be the same. They'd just stop 
changing. Many of us are in a financial situation where, you know, I kind of don't expect that much income growth anyway. I think I'd be okay. Um, but other people are not. And they, they are relying on that because, you know, they went into debt expecting future income growth. And it would be very difficult for them to meet their mortgage and so on. And so that's why mm. an economic slowdown can sometimes then go on and cascade and cause a financial crisis because a bunch of people bought houses relying on future income growth. The income growth doesn't materialize and then they have to default. And so, um, you know, one of the big, uh, it's been really important with the government's response that we try to prevent that sort of dynamic playing out. And do you have an idea what will happen to the economy when the people government stops paying people's salaries, the governments, the businesses go back to work, but maybe the demand's down and they have to lay people off? Do you, do you have any predictions about what could happen? Well, I think if you're looking forward, the part of the story you missed there is the vaccines have been discovered. Hmm. And, you know, knock on wood, they're going to be distributed efficiently. Well, not efficiently, but quickly. <laughs> and we're just a few months away from huge numbers of people individually being vaccinated. Now, I don't know about you, Jack, but when I'm vaccinated, it looks like it'll be safe for me to go to restaurants, both safe because I won't get sick, but also safe because I won't infect others. It appears, they're still working on this, but it appears that people who've been vaccinated won't infect other people. Mm. Um, and so then I, I haven't been to a restaurant in months, mate. I can't wait. <laughs> so you'll spend, spend, spend. Yeah. So look, at yeah. the very least, if, you know, if, if everything goes well, enough people are vaccinated, mm. we reach herd immunity, which simply means that the virus will find it so hard to find unvaccinated people, it will die out. And like, right. goodbye, COVID, yeah. piss off, and I never mm. want to see you again. <laughs> and we'll be in a largely post-COVID world, in which case 20, late 2021 or early 2022 might look a lot like 2019. Like, why would it be any different? Or if it could, you're saying it could be a boom time. It absolutely could. Think about what happens when wars bounce. End. Think about what happens when wars end, right? The the, mm. the troops come home, and they quickly get married. They want to start a family. They buy a house, and so on. One of the things that's actually happened is people have been saving a lot of money during the pandemic, not because their incomes are up, but instead because there's not that much to spend money on when you're locked in your house. Mm. And so a lot of people are going to have pretty healthy bank accounts. Um, not everyone. But a lot of people. Um, and I just, you know, in the same way that when the troops came back, they couldn't wait to go out dancing. Jack, I can't wait to go out dancing. <laughs> and I'm going to buy some pretty fancy drinks when I'm out there. And that may, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the demand, sh the, the demand boost mm -hmm. the economy needs. I was listening on another show about how you think there will be a baby boom now because everyone's stuck at home with nothing to do. But, you know, they'll be in bed. Yes. But, um, it turns out that yeah, so these factors, for example, people can't get their fertility treatment, right. so that's affecting it. Uh, young teens, where a lot of pregnancies come, are not mixing. Yep. Um, and also, people make decisions based, like you say, should I have what, what's the what's the margin? What's the extra one? Yep. They decide in, in uncertain times. They decide not to have a child. So this mm -hmm. is all really. So if we do get this boom, we could have a have a population boom as well. I like the fact that you've come out and you've predicted that. We're going to call it the uh, the Jack Boom. Um, <laughs> and there's going to be babies everywhere. And babies are adorable. And expensive. And adorable. Don't forget there's benefits <laughs> with those costs, brother. <laughs> you don't think like an economist sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, so, Please go on. Please go on. I was just going to say, there's nothing uneconomous about finding babies adorable. I, again, what we're interested in is the actual human condition mm. and people mm. love babies. And mm. when I'm being an economist, I have to say there's a benefit and I it, it sounds less romantic, um, but it's it's still the same set of ideas that I'm interested in. Speaking with you, I'm kind of surprised that you've written this academic textbook to, that you want to be to, be, to make it easier for economics students to understand economics, this, this principles of economics textbook and the macroeconomics. And I would have thought you'd be somebody more, because a lot of these economists write these sexy books with these mm -hmm. new terms about, you know, the new way of thinking about the economy. And maybe, you know, why did you decide to go down the, the very academic route rather than this, the sexy road? <laughs> You're right. Like, why not write the next Freakonomics? Um, yeah, the first, uh, that was one tip of my tongue. <laughs> the first answer is that I 
probably wouldn't be very good at it. Um, and the second is I don't want to be an airport book. I don't want someone to read it and enjoy it and move mm. on. I um, I really believe deeply in economics as, as a set of tools. And, um, you know, it's also, it's also not neither or. There are a million kids a year taking economics in the United States. Um, and so those are a million eyes I can see hit brains I can help mold mm -hmm. souls I can save um, and so you know it, it it's not the most academic thing in the world I just uh, you sat through an introductory economics class Jack it sounds like it didn't hit you just right um, <laughs> but I reckon you you know if you turned up to the first day of my class I, I think I could teach you a social science that you would both enjoy and find useful and so another because you must have you know the way you the way you think you must have sat down with your partner and say what's the most bang for our buck you know we have this yeah. many hours to write a book yep. strategically what's the what's the greatest need yep. what's missing and you came up with this solution after well, lots of research yes everything i do you're absolutely right um look if what you want to do is use whatever gifts you have to make the world a better place a really important thing is to think about the audience size and so it's very easy for me to find people who want to fly me around the country to give a talk in front of 40 people. And then you give the talk and the 40 look at you lovingly and they applaud and you feel very good about it. But the value of that versus writing a New York Times column that could be read by tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions or writing a textbook that could be literally read by millions. Um, so you've always got to be thinking about the scale of what you're doing. Um, a million every year, new students all the time. It's like... Because these 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 um, airplane books, mm -hmm. they they go they go out of fashion. They're replaced, but yeah, I mean, how like the textbook your your uh, bef that came before? What was the name of it? The famous uh, Paul Samuelson. I think you might be thinking about. So Samuelson famously once said, "I don't care." I'll paraphrase. I don't care who writes a country's laws as long as I can write its economics textbooks. Um, <laughs> and there's a very famous John Maynard Keynes quote where he says that you know in the minds of in the backs of the minds of people, they don't understand it, but they're influenced by the scribblings of um, of old economists. And I will tell you, I've talked to enough congressmen where they have very strong views about the economy. And I know for sure and for certain what I'm really hearing are the prejudices of their first year university economics teacher. Um, wow. You know, they take these views, they hold them seriously. Um, and, you know, so one way of thinking about what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate millions of people. Another way is the next generation in Congress, if we're successful in this enterprise, many of them will have learned economics um, from wow. our book. And that would be That's exciting. Fantastic. Yeah. How long was the, is the book in, in, in use before, the one before you? Well, so there's, uh, Paul Samuelson wrote his book roughly 50 years ago. Uh, a 50 bit, years ago a little bit more than that it's a truly great book though he's um paul samuelson was one of the greatest economists of all time and also one of the greatest economics educators ever um, so did you make sure to cover all his all the aspects that he covered uh i have read every economics textbook um almost <laughs> ever written um so uh but you know my job is not to translate what um the scribblings of old dead white men it's to um, understand the excitement of the field today and so much mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the things we've been talking about are very much things that modern economists talk about and they weren't there in Keynes and they weren't there in Marshall. Um, and there is so much exciting economics going on and I get to be part of that field and then translate it for a broader audience. And is it still just Keynesianism or monetarism? Is it is it just shades of these... Um, I, let me give a completely unsatisfying answer, which is I don't like names. <laughs> um, what I try and – one's responsibility as a textbook author is different than that of an economist. When I'm talking to a policymaker, I will give them a particular view grounded in a particular perspective. Okay. My job, though, is to teach first-year university students the consensus view of economists, and that's neither fully Keynesian nor fully monetarist. And there have actually been several tribes and sub-tribes in, in the years since you studied economics – and they still fight it out each and every day. Um, but along the way, they make some progress. And so the profession's best understanding of the world doesn't fit either tribal caricature. Um, it's all about understanding the reality of the world we live in rather than the unreality of the models we write down. Mm. I spoke to Russ Roberts. Ah. And he, yeah, he's been spoken just after so many economists. He's kind of come, I wouldn't say disillusioned, but that you shouldn't let these 
literally rule your lives like this. You shouldn't much. shouldn't let what live your life. I shouldn't let the, these. You know, when you make a decision, you know, do I need do I need these numbers? He's writing a book now about don't let numbers rule your life. So. Well, it's a funny thing for us to say, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I'm saying let numbers rule your life. I think all yeah. of these passions that are very human still have form in economic models. And so what we want to do is not be doctrinaire. So one of the things I say actually very early in my textbook, and I say it when I teach, um, people sometimes say the problem with economics is it assumes everyone's selfish. It doesn't. Mm. Economics isn't... It's, applying the cost benefit principle is not selfish if you're not selfish. Mm. I could go and buy you a, a cup of coffee next time we cross paths, Jack. And some people say, well, economics says that's not rational. Well, Jack, if I like making you happy, if I like spending time with you, if I like just, we're human. Buying someone a cup mm. of coffee is actually intensely enjoyable. And so I don't have to be selfish. What I need is economics to recognize the reality that we're altruistically linked, that we want to be liked, that all of the complexity of of how we are actually wired. So, you know, if Russ is saying don't follow the calculations, um, what I'd say is actually, you know, follow your heart. What I'd say is make the calculations yeah. include your heart. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah. More heart based than. Well, let's bring based, the heart yeah. into the calculations because any economics mm. that 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 things that can abstract from the really important motivations that we have things like the desire to reproduce um mm. is an economics that'll make a lot of mistakes that's great i really feel that i'm getting this sense from the, you're really doing this out of from a love-based position to try and influence the future of the world economies that's that's real something to aim for no mate i can tell you you don't spend the number of hours i've spent on these things um <laughs> just on a lark so you know learning to ride a unicycle that's a lark and i'm terrible at it yeah. um spending thousands of hours trying to think about how best to distill and then communicate economics to a broader public uh there's these big black circles under my eyes um that have arisen <laughs> because i've burned a lot of midnight oil and you know we, look there's this economic principle called the comparative advantage principle um and basically it says find the thing that you're best at relative to others and for me um, it may well be distilling and then communicating economics. And um, that leaves plenty of important roles for others because there are people who are much smarter than me at thinking the big ideas um, and doing the hard math and, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and maybe what I'm doing is just the simple front end, um, but that's where my advantage lies. Would you like to be a policy advisor for one of these big countries? <laughs> well, guiding their guiding their economic actions. Well, so first of all, um, I do some amount of policy work. Um, so um, you know, I get calls from congressional representatives every now and then, and um, central bankers, and so on. Um, everyone in economics knows each other. So um, my mm -hmm. phone rings in way. You know, I used to be on the um, the congressional budget office, council of advisors, and and so on. Um, Betsy most recently was part of the Biden Harris transition team. Um, oh really? So she spent the last three months basically on Zoom calls, trying to figure out what the the new Biden Treasury should do, which is now the new Janet Yellen Treasury. Um, and yes, we talked about it over dinner. Um, and, you know, <laughs> uh, so you know, no, I think economics absolutely should be all about informing policy. And then if I sounded otherwise, I apologise. What I do think though is that economics can be about policy, not just at the Treasury. Economists can inform health policy. We can inform education policy. We can inform crime policy. We really do have a tremendous potential to make the world a better place. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do. Gosh, wow. This has been such an inspiring conversation. I, I, I feel like we've just stopped now just because we've reached this peak. I'm worried that if we keep going on... <laughs> you, you, know. <laughs> you describe everything yeah. like a song. Yeah. And that oh. sounds like your comparative advantage, Jack. I was just thinking about my. I shouldn't talk about myself too much, but it is my show. So yes, but that is kind of I'm. I'm like a songwriter doing something that other songwriters aren't doing. Yeah. So right, yeah. find your niche, brother. Right. Exactly. And so yeah. I, I, you know, and I will say you are remarkably well prepared for this interview. Um, oh, thank you very much. Uh, so there aren't many people who can be both the master journalist and a musician, um, and so that's really something. Oh, wow. Got a warm glow here. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, 
I've got to write a song then. I was thinking this uh, to complete my my uh, trilogy of relationship songs. I could do sunk cost fallacy. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Is that unless you I, have a better idea? I challenge yourself, mate. It's uh, <laughs> I, if I knew anything about songwriting, I'd be doing it right now. Um, but uh, um, you know. Find the spark and go with it. That's the advice I'd give my students. And uh, I'm sure that's the, the same goes for you. Thank you very much, Justin. This has been wonderful. I'm going to see where the spark takes me. Jack, it's a pleasure. All right. Thanks very much. All right, man. I've done a differential game model on a partnership. The results are what you'd expect Based on effort and appeal Our loving is ideal Cause we've both so heavily invested But it's not the sunk cost fallacy That keeps us together It's the ongoing returns And compounded interest Not the sunk cost Fallacy why we go on forever It's a high yield bond versus a high yield bond I love the economics of love tuning in as always please like subscribe share do anything you can to help promote the show if you want to hear the song again you can go to spotify itunes deezer etc stream it there or buy it for a dollar on podsongs.com this will help support my musicians Maurizio San Nicola Massimino Vozza and my researcher Dori Verber thanks for tuning in see you next time <laughs>